good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, everyone who signed on online, we have a lot of material to cover tonight, and this is a very, very important topic. So, um, when it comes to pulmonary medication, there is a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of misunderstanding out there. And this misinformation can actually lead to people not getting the maximum benefit from their medication. So, as you know, we talk about ultimate pulmonary wellness. And what that means is taking every component of your life and trying to maximize the benefit that you get from each one. So whether it's exercise or taking your medications properly or nutrition or stress management or prevention of infection, the only way that you're going to achieve ultimate pulmonary wellness or whatever that means to you is to make efforts in each area. And medications are so important. And when we talk about that, the medications, there's so much confusion, not just amongst patients, okay? When I sign on to the boards and I look at the questions that people ask me, patients are really misunderstood. Patients really don't understand how to take their medications properly. Um, and even amongst clinicians, I've asked many physicians and respiratory therapists and nurses and other people, what is the best way to take medications? And what is the optimal order? And what do each medication do? Um, and I think that each time I ask people, there are often um, multiple disconnects and multiple um, you know, things that people say differently or things that um, people explain differently. And very often, things are not explained at all. So tonight, I hope to clarify a lot of different aspects about proper medication use so that you will be able to maximize your use for your own best health. Um, the other thing is that um, a lot of times what I see is that patients don't know what they're taking or why they're taking it. Um, that's loud. That makes <laughs> um, So. All right, so let's start it off. Okay, a lot of times when, excuse me for one second. Roger, you cannot, you got it, that's loud. I'm sorry, but that's really loud. I know you can't hear me now, right? But that's really loud. I can hear everything that you're, that you're doing there. So I'm sorry, I need you to stop. Okay, one other thing I want to say. When people try to teach about pulmonary medications, okay, I see, in what my opinion is not the clearest way of teaching because people often take an approach of either using the type of medication, meaning what class of drugs is it, or they try to take an approach of short acting versus long acting, or they try to take an approach of rescue versus preventer, or they try to take an approach of timing it out, or they try to take an approach of what is the order that you should take it in. But in fact, you really need to, to know all of these things. And just to understand that what I'm going to talk to you about it tonight is not my recommendation to you. These are my observations based on my last 22 years of taking care of pulmonary patients and what things work best and what things don't work very well. Anything you are thinking about doing based on my recommendations tonight, please discuss and clear with your doctor, okay? Only with your physicians, clearance and guidance and approval are you to take anything that I say as anything other than chit chat, okay? Um, now, with that being said, I want to talk about all those things tonight, and hopefully you will have a good understanding of how to take your medications. Now, every week I say something to the effect of everybody is different, and not all things are going to work for all people. So what I'm going to talk about tonight are general principles and in the same way that when we talk about breathing, in for two and out for four is a, a guideline, it's a starting point, I'm gonna give you what I think is the most commonly and most effective use of these things, but there are certainly gonna be people who write to me and say, well, I tried exactly what you said, and that didn't work, what worked better for me was this. So if I say anything tonight, and you think you have a better way of doing it, by all means, send it in to me, and I'm happy to learn from you, okay? As I've said before, 75% to 90% of what I know, I have learned from my patients. So if you have a better way, or you know something that I don't know, or you know about a medication that I don't know, by all means, hit me by email or phone or any way you want to get in touch with me. With that being said, let's get going. So the first thing to talk about is really, um, so what is the purpose of pulmonary medications? Does anyone here have an idea? What is the goal of taking your pulmonary medications? 
that you can breathe. So you can breathe. Okay, so absolutely. So we talk all the time about the fact that breathing is multifactorial, okay? Meaning there are many factors that go into how well you can or can't breathe. So to be more specific, okay, what, is, what about breathing are we trying to impact with our pulmonary medications? There's two major goals of pulmonary medications. Does anyone know what they are? The first is to get to uh, inhale and exhale the uh, air, oxygen. So to inhale and exhale the oxygen, okay? So that's right. We want to be able to move air in and out quickly, uh, not quickly, but we want to move it out freely and easily, okay? We don't want to struggle to move air in or to move air out, right? But even more specifically, there are two major aspects of taking pulmonary medication that are going to help us breathe better, that are going to help us move air in and out more quick, more easily. So what are we talking about? I'm going to give one more shot and then I'm going to... Are you talking about like airways and um, dilating? Airways, dilating, yes, keep it coming. So Bronchi, let's make dilating. Bronchi, dilating. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's go right here for a second. Okay, so this is an airway. Specifically, this is the trachea. Okay, you know on the other side of this board, there's my A plus level respiratory system, but I didn't want to flip this in the middle. Here's a trachea. This is your windpipe. This is the right main stem bronchus. This is the left main stem bronchus. So remember, when we talk about bronchi, we're talking about the large airways, right? Trachea, left main stem bronchus, right main stem bronchus, and then these continue to branch, okay? So just imagine that these continue to branch like a tree, and there are multiple, continues to go to smaller and smaller bronchi, and then we go to bronchioles, and then we go to the alveoli, which remember are the air sacs where gas exchange actually occurs, okay? So when we talk about the purpose of respiratory medications, okay, we are talking specifically about two things. And we're talking about bronchodilation, and we're talking about anti-inflammation, okay? So one thing is that when people first get diagnosed with a pulmonary disease, or they go to see their doctor and they've never been on meds before, they're handed something that looks like this, right? Prescriptions, okay? So here you go, you have a prescription for Advair, and you have a prescription for Spiriva, and you have a prescription for Albuterol, and under normal circumstances, this looks like every other prescription you've ever gotten. And you don't think to say, well, Advair, what kind of drug is that? Albuterol, what kind of drug is that? Spiriva, what kind of drug is that? Is there any order I should take these in? What timing should I take these in, okay? So you put this in your pocket thinking that this is gonna be a nice, easy thing to do, except for the fact that when you go home, okay, instead of having some nice, easy things to do, you wind up with a disc, an egg, and a pump, okay? So I'm looking at these and saying, hmm, looks like a pump, hmm, looks like an egg. Is this how I take it? Or here's a disc, this makes me wanna play a sport with it. And to the average person and to many clinicians, okay, I'm thinking to myself, well, what the heck are these things, okay? And how am I supposed to use them? And then I go back to these instructions, which now are printed on my pharmacy label, right? And it says, Advair, two puffs, two times per day, 12 hours apart. It doesn't tell me what 12 hours, right? And it doesn't tell me how to take the puffs, but those things can be important. And then I have something that says Spiriva, and I go, Spiriva, is that the pump or the egg or the disc? Okay, that's my, my egg, okay? And it says, two puffs, or it says one dose once a day. And then it says albuterol, and, it's, and I, I go to this and I have my Proair, okay, which is the, the brand name for albuterol, and it says two puffs as needed, or two puffs every four to six hours, or two puffs in case of emergency, or two puffs in this. And that is very confusing, okay? So if it's confusing for the clinician, okay, then it's definitely gonna be confusing for the patient. And as I show this to you right here, okay, if you've never had any experience with this in the past, then you don't know that this one here is a short-acting bronchodilator, and that this one here is actually two medications, a long-acting anticholinergic and a long-acting beta-2 agonist, and that this one is a long-acting anticholinergic, okay? Right, I take that back. 
a long-acting beta-2 agonist, and a, and, a, and a steroid, okay? And this is a long-acting anticholinergic. Now, just even listen to those words that I just said, and most people are saying, what language is he speaking, okay? So t tonight, I want to try to break this down into English for you so that you don't even have to worry about any of those words or these names. You just have to know what you are taking, okay? And so with that in mind, I have given you this handout right here, okay? And this handout essentially has all of the bronchodilators, okay? Now, in my opinion, the way that I would teach this to you in exactly the wrong way that would get you confused and leave you so far, like with your head spinning so much that you're not even gonna be able to understand the basics of what I'm talking about, would be to go through all of these and say, the generic name is perbuterol, the brand name is Maxair. Terbutaline, Salmeterol, A4 Motorol, you don't need to know those things, okay? And so for me to try to get you to understand what each one of those things is would be a futile attempt at teaching you, but would be an excellent attempt at confusing you, okay? So I'm gonna try to unconfuse you and teach you. So the way to do this, okay, you'll notice that I have this broken down, okay, into, first of all, I first have it broken down into two main categories, okay? And the two main categories are bronchodilators, and anti-inflammatories. So that's the first breakdown. So we have the top of the triangle that says pulmonary medications. The next breakdown is bronchodilators and anti-inflammatories, right? So we said bronchodilators. Bronco is the airways, dilators open them up. So remember I talked about the purpose, right? So the first thing is to open the airways. The second column is anti-inflammatories. And remember what I said, the second purpose is is to decrease inflammation, right? And then bronchodilators is broken down even further, and I'm only gonna say these words once or twice because they're not important, but you need to understand that there are two types of bronchodilators that are particularly prescribed for pulmonary patients, and those are anticholinergics and beta-2 agonists, okay? That's the confusing part right now. Let's make it simple. So when we talk about airflow through the airways, okay, one thing that's very important to understand is that your airways have the ability to dilate, meaning open and constrict based on the circumstances. So as an example, a circumstance where you might want your airways to open up would be if you're walking up the stairs, okay, or you're getting chased by a bear, or you are lifting your laundry and putting it away. You want them to open up in order to increase the supply, in order to meet the demand of the work that you're doing. And we talk about supply and demand every week, right? So the airways are designed to open when you need it and constrict when you don't need it or in an effort to protect you. So what do you mean an effort to protect you, okay? Let's say you're standing on 38th Street and 5th Avenue and a bus comes by and shoots a whole bunch of exhaust at you, okay? Your body is designed to protect you from that. And so with that in mind, that would be a great time for you to bronchoconstrict or for your airways to close, except the problem for that is for people with pulmonary disease, excuse me for one second, just have to get some water. Okay, so for people with pulmonary disease, the problem is that we have an over-inflammation, right? Inflammation is never a good thing, but for people with pulmonary disease, there's super amount of inflammation, and there's a super amount of bronchoconstriction. And that bronchoconstriction can occur in either inhalation or exhalation. So as an example, if we look at our airway again, okay? One thing that you need to know is that the way that the airways open and close is that there's a, a smooth, there's a layer of thin layer of smooth muscle that lines the airway. And in the same way that this muscle can contract and relax, this muscle can contract and relax also. So in other words, if you get hit with a bunch of smog or you're working, you pass a farm and there's like a whole bunch of wheat, you know, chat, uh, wheat 
spray that comes at you, okay? These muscles are gonna tighten up, okay? And when those muscles tighten up, so what we really want, okay, is we want a nice open airway. So this is as if I cut this in half right here and now we're looking through it, okay? So we want there to be a nice open airway for air to move in and for air to move out. But when these areas, the smooth muscle can become inflamed and it can become thickened. So now look what's happening when this muscle becomes thickened, that means that this airway actually becomes narrower, okay? So if you're having a particularly bad day, a lot of times people come in and they say, I'm having a bad day today. Well, what does that mean? It means maybe there's more smog in the air, maybe it's colder because the effect of cold on this smooth muscle is to constrict it, right? So cold is gonna tighten it up. Humidity is gonna make it tougher because you have to move a thicker amount of air through, okay? So the impact of humidity is similar to the fact that if I were drinking, let's say, a milkshake through a straw as compared to water, it's gonna be much harder for me to move that milkshake through because it's thicker, it's heavier. So if you have air that's much more humid, okay, it's gonna be thicker, it's gonna be heavier, you're gonna to have to work harder with each breath to essentially move that air in and out. So again, the goal of pulmonary medications is bronchodilation, meaning to open the airways, right? To get those things to open, to open this here, which is called the lumen, which is the hole that it goes through, and also anti-inflammation. Any questions so far? Yes? Does the, does the inflammation and the, uh, what else did you say is there? So bronchoconstriction is one thing, okay? So the airways tighten up. So the question was, what else is there besides no, no, inflammation? No, those so what's, two things exist. Do they exist at the same time? They definitely can exist. So the question was, when we talk about inflammation and bronchoconstriction, do those things exist at the same time? Not only do they exist at the same time, but they're like buddies, okay? So the more inflammation you have, Right? So remember the pulmonary function test. Let's think back to the pulmonary function test. So you take a deep breath in, you let it out slow, then you take a deep breath in, you force it out, right? So the harder you have to work to move air in and out, the more effort you're using, the actual more inflamed and the more constricted you can get. That could actually trigger bronchoconstriction. And this is why things can creep up on you so fast to where you're fine one second, and then all of a sudden it's like this cascade. It's like a pair, it's like a spiraling effect of out of control. And we talk about every week that red alert, right? So let me just point the situation out to you. So let's say you're inflamed anyway, right? The air quality is poor, there's a high ozone alert, there's a lot of smog in the air. So now, this smooth muscle becomes inflamed. So what does that mean? It can become thicker, it can become more irritable, right? And so by nature of the fact that we have a smaller airway now, and a thicker muscle, okay, that really doesn't move in and out as, as well, we now have to work harder with each breath, right? So were you ever trying to lift something up really heavy, right? And you're trying to lift, you're trying to lift, and then you go, oh, my back, right? Your back muscles go into spasm. Same thing can happen with these airways, okay? So now you have this increased inflammation, you have a smaller hole that you're trying to push air through in and out, and you're working harder with each breath, and as that's happening, these muscles are getting tighter and tighter and more constricted. And remember when we talk about red alert, now we're going, oh my God, I'm having more trouble breathing. Panic is starting to set in, right? Now I'm gonna work, I'm gonna breathe harder, I'm gonna breathe faster, I'm gonna breathe shallower, and we're going down, 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 down. Remember, this is the time to talk to yourself, okay? Remember my face, stop, I know what to do here, let's start breathing, okay? But. What we wanna to try to do, and what I wanna to try to teach you about tonight, is how do we prevent all this, okay? Because let me tell you something, the way that you take your medications can have a major impact on how this whole cascade occurs. Meaning that if you do it right, you have the greatest opportunity at getting the least inflammation and the most bronchodilation for the longest period of time. And if you don't do it right, and not doing it right could mean a number of things, it could mean not doing it at the right time, it can mean not doing it in the right order, it can mean doing the technique wrong, okay? Any one of those things can compromise the effectiveness of how much benefit you get from your, your, your medications, okay? And people come to me all the time and they say things like, I say, are you on Spiriva? And they say, well, I tried Spiriva but I didn't think it was doing, doing anything for me. I say, oh, do you have a rescue medication? Well, I tried albuterol but it didn't seem to work for me. And then I say to them, can I see you do this, 
or can I see you take the medication? And when I see them do it, I know immediately why it's not working for them because they're not doing it right and they're not actually getting the medication. So if my goal is to take a Tylenol because I have a headache, but only you know one out of every four Tylenol I take makes it into my mouth because I throw it over my shoulder, I'm not going to get any benefit from that. And there's a very similar technique and there's a very similar phenomenon when it comes to respiratory medication because if you're not doing the technique right, if you're not doing it in the right order, if the medication isn't actually getting down into the lungs, okay, where your body can use it, then there's no point in doing it. It's like not taking the medication. That's what I'm going to try to clear up tonight. Question. Um, I just want to get to, I want to get to context. That that um that that. Are you asking that, what this is? What? Are you asking what is this right here? Well, I want to know where things are. The lungs are down there. So this is your windpipe right here. So the okay. question is where are things? So this is starting at the top. This is my windpipe, okay? At this level where the right and left main stem bronchus change, okay, or split is right about here. So then it comes to here, okay? Then it branches into three on the right side and two on the left side. And then our lungs actually come up and over, okay, and then come down and they're actually going to come down and lower in the back, okay? But this can take up your whole chest, your whole thoracic cavity. And if you have emphysema where you have a, a very difficult time blowing air out, where hyperinflation is very, very common, then you're actually going to have bigger lungs and they're going to take up more of your chest, okay? So let's go to how do you use these medications, okay? So we talked about the fact that there are two, two different major divisions. So the major divisions are bronchodilators and anti-inflammatories. And then bronchodilators split again into beta-2 agonists and anticholinergic. So at this time, I want you to just take a minute to look at this list, okay? Go down the list and depending upon who you are and what type of medications you're taking, circle the medication that you take. So like if you think about in the 70s, when you went to a Chinese restaurant and they said, I'll take one from column A and one from column B and one from column C, Chris, no disrespect, um, but, um, but the thing is that that's kind of how this works, okay? So the most commonly used things that I see, what I have here is, I don't have all the medications here, but these are my bronchodilators, okay? So those are the first split. That's one way to split it up, into bronchodilators versus anti-inflammatories, and then beta-2 agonists versus anticholinergic. Another way to split it up is short-acting versus long-acting. So by the time we're done tonight, I hope you're going to understand all of this. But just think, this is confusing as heck, okay? However, it's going to become real simple for you, because all you're going to have is probably three, maximum, four of these. So for now, circle what you take, okay? So most people take a com you know, take one anticholinergic and it's usually either a short acting. I'll tell you the most commonly used ones. So when it comes to, ideally what people, there's, there's also one thing which is that there's a lot of drugs that are combination drugs, okay? There are drugs that are a combination of long acting beta-2 agonist, which is a bronchodilator, and a steroid, and those are these right here. So a lot of people are on Advair, okay? So again, how you would do this is go down and look and say, well, I'm on Advair. Circle the three or four that you take. A lot of people are on Simbacor, okay? These are very commonly used. So if you take Advair or Simbacor, both of these medications are what we consider long-acting medications, and both of these medications are a combination of an anti-inflammatory and a long-acting beta-2 agonist, right? So if we take the Chinese menu analogy and say one from column A and one from column B, I now have a long-acting, I have a long-acting beta-2 agonist, okay, and I have a, a, an anti-inflammatory. So the only thing missing from that is it a long-acting anticholinergic, and the most commonly used long-acting anticholinergics are going to be Spiriva, and something new on the market, which I see only with some people, is Tudorza. Okay? So if you're taking Advair or Simbacort, you now have two of the three classes. If you add into it Spiriva or Tudorza, you've now covered all three classes 
in a long-acting way. Okay? Now, the thing about that is, for some people, that's not enough. And you say, well, that's not enough. What does that mean? And I would want to really investigate it. Because if you're telling me that this is not enough to give you good long-acting bronchodilation, then we need to figure out a way to improve upon that, okay? And the thing is, what I want to help you understand tonight is that there are some things that work over the long term, meaning days to weeks. There are some things that work over the long term, meaning over the course of 12 hours. And there are some things that work over the short term, over the course of four to six hours, okay? So what does that mean? We talked about the goals, okay? And the goals are anti-inflammation and bronchodilation. So when I asked what are the goals of respiratory medications, I heard things like the goal is to help me breathe better, the goal is to move air in and out as best as possible, right? Now, would most of you agree that there are some times when your breathing is better than others? Right? So there are some days when your breathing is better than others. There are some weeks when your breathing is better than others and worse than others. But also, can you also say there are some times during the day when your breathing is better or worse than others? Of course. So breathing is multifactorial. There's a lot of factors that go into it. So naturally, it's not always going to be the same, although it would be great if it would be the same, right? And it would be great if it were the same at a very high level of air movement. So that is our goal. So my, I just want to show you something here to introduce this concept, and we're going to go into it much more deeply down the road. But take a look at this, okay? So what I've drawn here, and you should also have something similar to this, and it looks like this, okay? Except it's going in the other direction. So this is the start of your day. 6 a.m., 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., 10 p.m., 12 midnight, 2 a.m., 4 p.m., okay? So I'm showing you that there are 24 hours in a day. For that information alone, it was worth you signing in, and feel free to use that in your personal life. That one's on me. But, okay, here's your bronchodilation. So here's your ability to breathe. So this is, you are the most bronchodilated and air is moving at its best, right? And it would be great if we could be maximally bronchodilated with the least inflammation for all the hours of the day, okay? Now, I'm not promising you that if you do what I say tonight, you're gonna to be maximally bronchodilated 24 hours per day. But what I'm trying to avoid is this sort of, I'm having trouble now, now I'm really having trouble, let me take something to boost this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And the reason for that is because the airways don't like change. So in other words, if you live in a cold Arctic area, okay, your airways may hate you at the beginning, but if it were always the same, you would ultimately have some adaptation that would help you be less inflamed over the long term. Okay? If you lived in a hot, humid area, not that it's ideal, but eventually over time, if you stayed in the same hot, humid area, okay, you would eventually have some adaptations that allow you to be less inflamed and more bronchodilated. When you live in a city like New York, where one day it could be 64 and humid, and the next day it could be 20 and frigid and closing your airways up, the airways don't like that. They become very, very irritable, okay? So what we wanna try to do is we wanna try to understand what's going on with our airways, while at the same time knowing very clearly what each one of these medications does. Because if I want to put a, ha a nail into a piece of wood and I bring over a screwdriver, well then I'm screwed, okay? And that is what can happen sometimes if you're taking the wrong medication. So if you're in a jam, if you're walking in the street and you are all of a sudden about to hit code red and you say, wait, what do I have with me? I have my flow vent which is an anti-inflammatory, that flow bag, you can take the whole bottle. That's not going to get you out of that jam. And like I said before, I don't think people necessarily know what each one of these things are or what they do. And that's like saying, well, I know I want to build a house, but I don't know the difference between a wrench and a hammer and a screwdriver. And that's what I want you to understand after tonight. So again, our goal is maximum bronchodilation for the long term and over the course of the day. Okay, and I'm gonna hopefully try to get you to understand a little better how that actually occurs.
So let's start with the long-acting medications, okay? So the majority of people are taking either, are, are taking one medication that's a combination medication. So if you look down under combination medications, okay, you see Advair and you see Simbacort, okay? There's also two others that I see periodically. One is called Dulera, one is called um, Brio Elipta, which is kind of new, but essentially what these all have in common is that they have a long-acting beta-2 agonist and a steroid, okay, an anti-inflammatory. Now, let me just talk about bronchodilators for a minute, okay? The two classifications are anticholinergic beta-2 agonist. So we've spoken numerous times about the autonomic nervous system, right? And we have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Real simple, sympathetic is fight or flight. So if you're in a jam and you need to get in out of that jam, you want your airways to be open, you want your heart to be pumping hard, you want your eyes to be open, you want blood delivered to your muscles, okay? That's the sympathetic nervous system and that's also gonna open the airways in your lungs, okay? So what we have here is a beta-2 agonist is going to work through the pathway that assists the sympathetic nervous system. And by that, we're going to get bronchodilation. Okay? Now there's another pathway. The parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. So let's go back to the food analogy where we just had a big meal and now we're feeling sleepy and all the blood is to our gut and our airways are starting to feel like it's a little more difficult to breathe that's not the time you want to necessarily step into a boxing ring and fight or fight off a mugger, okay? But what this does, okay, is this is anti-cholinergic. So this one is pro-sympathetic and this one is anti-parasympathetic. So those are having the absolute positive effects of, of eliminating rest and digest and stimulating fight or flight, all with the idea of opening up the airway. Okay, so what that's going to do is that's going to cause this muscle to dilate, cause this right here to open up, allowing more air to move in and out. When we talk about anti-inflammatories, we are talking about steroids. Okay? What this does is it acts on the long-term basis to reduce inflammation. So as I mentioned before, if you're highly inflamed, okay, and this smooth muscle inside your airways is thickened, okay, narrowing the amount of air that can move in and out. Over the long term, okay, what's going to happen is this steroid is going to work to decrease that inflammation little by little, causing the muscles to relax, causing the muscles to become less swollen. In the same way that if you have a sprained ankle and you put ice on it, these anti-inflammatories are going to reduce inflammation, opening up the airways, opening up this here so that you can move air in and out. But by combining all three of those, we are attacking the fire in as many ways as possible, and that's our goal. Now let's talk about it from a different perspective, okay? Question. Somehow I got lost. What, what all three of are you trying to inflammation? There's two. So there's is reducing it. So the question is, what all three are we trying to affect? We're trying to affect two, but we have two classes that do bronchodilation. So we have two classes, anticholinergic and beta 2 agonists. So they're all bronchodilators, but they work in two different pathways. Okay? So that's one. The other is anti-inflammation, which is the steroid. Now, this is a good time to talk about steroids. A lot of people say, I don't want to take a steroid, I don't want to take a steroid. They have terrible reputation. This is, when you take a steroid inhaled, it's a lot different than taking an oral steroid like prednisone, okay? Now that being said, when you need it, you need it, okay? If you're in a jam, if you're in an acute exacerbation and you need a, a steroid, by all means you need to take it. But the beauty of an inhaled steroid, as the type that is in Advair, as the type that is in a Simbacort, as is Flovent, okay? The beauty of that is you don't have the systemic effects of taking a pill. So when you take prednisone, okay, that goes through the whole body and it doesn't discriminate between the lungs or the joints or the 
you know, the other areas of your body, which is why a lot of times when people start taking prednisone, in addition to having their breathing they get better, they're like, wow, my hips feel great, I feel like dancing, or something like that. But the negative side of the, in, of the oral steroids is that there's many side effects. So it can cause you to retain fluid, it can cause you to gain weight, it can cause you to increase your blood sugars, it can cause osteoporosis, it can cause your skin to be thinner, okay? It can cause you to bruise more easily. Sounds terrible, but again, when you need it, you need it. The beauty of inhaled corticosteroids is that number one, they act locally, right? So you're inhaling them, so they're going directly to the area that you want it to go without the systemic effects, okay? And that's a benefit. Those are two big benefits. So they're going right where you want it, you don't have the systemic effects. So let's talk for a second about short acting versus long acting, okay? Another way to think about this is rescue versus preventer, okay? So a short acting drug would be considered something that lasts anywhere from four to six hours, gets you out of a jam, okay, but then you need to replace it. And when you think about any of these drugs, okay, essentially what happens is a drug, you will take a medication, it will ramp up, it will reach its peak, peak effect, and then once it reaches that peak effect, it starts to lose its effectiveness, okay? So the importance of this is to understand that we are trying to get you to get maximum effectiveness at all time. Now, if you look at this sheet here, okay, this is a worksheet for you. So by this time, you should have circled all of your medications on this sheet so that you know where you're gonna place those on this sheet. So this sheet right here is just the vertical version of this right here. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm trying to get you to problem solve as a worksheet how you're gonna take your medications through the course of the day. The simplest way to do this is to start with our long-acting medications. And those are the medications that you want to take 12 hours apart. So for the majority of people, that's either going to be Advair or Simbacort or um, you know things like Dulera or things like Brio Ellipta. Okay, so remember with those four medications that I, I just mentioned, those are a combination of anti-inflammatory and long-acting beta-2 agonists, right? Those must be taken more than 12 hours apart, or at least 12 hours apart. Really, it should be not, not more than 12 hours apart, and it shouldn't be at least 12 hours apart. It should be 12 hours apart. Remember how I told you the body doesn't like change. So the more consistent you can be with this, the better it's going to be. A lot of times people come to me and I say, did you take your Advair today? No, I haven't been taking it this week. Why haven't you been taking this? I haven't had a hard time breathing, okay? But understand that these steroids work over the long term, okay? It's human nature, okay? We lost some weight, I can have a brownie, okay? I feel better, I don't have to take my medication. It is human nature, okay? But I'm telling you right now, if you're questioning whether or not you should take your medication, think about how you feel when you feel really bad. Because you know what? If you've been taking this regular, 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 and now you stop taking it, guess what? Over the next few days, weeks, you know, however long it may be, you're gonna start losing that benefit that you got from this. So these need to be taken regularly, okay? The next most common anti, the next most common long-term drug that people can take, long-acting drug, is gonna be Spiriva. So again, these types of drugs have a combination of two columns, right? So this is column A, beta-2 agonist, column C, anti-inflammatory, this is column B, which is anticholinergic. So with this, I've got all three columns. You wanna take them together, okay? Because it's been proven that when taken together, okay, there's an increased benefit and an increased bronchodilation. Now. What a lot of people don't know, and I've been asking physicians this, what a lot of physicians don't even discuss is the fact that, is there an order in which you should take these? Okay, so let's think about what's in here. This is a bronchodilator and a steroid. This is a bronchodilator. Let me give you some information right now. The steroid is the star of the show. Everything else is a warm-up act. 
okay? So think about this airway inflammation that I talked to you about before, and imagine, a lot of people don't feel good when they wake up in the morning, right? So let's say you wake up in the morning and you're feeling tight, you're feeling constricted, you're feeling like you're not moving air in and out very well. So let's just say we're gonna take this and make it like this. So think of this as a four lane street, right? So now my airways are inflamed, okay? And that cuts my street to two lanes. And maybe it's morning and you've been draining mucus all night and now you have big pieces of mucus here, and those are like double parked cars, right? So now you want to drive down that street, and guess what? There's less lanes for you, and you have to go around double parked cars, right? Same thing with the airways. So now if you wake up and you're not feeling well, and we know that the steroid is the star of the show, okay? This is like the guy holding the bowl right in football so we want some blockers out there to clear the way so that this running back has a clear passage to the end zone the end zone is your lungs right so we want some blockers to have a clear passage so that we don't waste that guy with the ball which is our steroid i have read so many different things about this i have asked many different people i promise you and no disrespect to mark mangus respiratory therapist who put out something really great about what order should you take your medications in. Um, but I have a way of thinking about it that makes sense to me. Again, I'm not saying to do it my way. I'm saying read everything you can, ask your doctor if there's a better way. But think about it like this. If I'm blocked up, right, and I want to take my medication that contains a bronchodilator and my steroid, am I going to get some bronchodilation benefits from it? Absolutely. But maybe that bronchodilation is only gonna open me up to here, and it's working so hard to do that 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 steroid's not gonna enter into my lung. Okay, or I'm not gonna get the maximum amount of steroid into my lung that I want. So in my personal opinion, what I would do if I were taking these medications is I would take the one that's only a bronchodilator first, which is my Aspiriva. Why? Because I'm going to get some bronchodilator effects of this, all right? So now, we're clearing double park cars, we're clearing double park cars, we're clearing double park cars. So even if the airways are still thick, meaning even though I still have two lanes instead of four lanes, guess what? When it's time for the star of the show to come on, he doesn't have to step over all this junk in the way. There's a nice, clear pathway into the lungs. So in my opinion, to take the steroid first, or the combination bronchodilator steroid first, you may not be getting the full benefit of the steroid, and that steroid is going to, over the long term, decrease your inflammation. So what I would suggest, take your long-acting anticholinergic first, which is usually either Spiriva, okay, um, or uh, what am I looking for? Where did I put all my stuff? Um, essentially, we're talking about Spiriva, or, or, no, not Simbacord, Spiriva or Tudorza. Let me just double check to make sure I'm not saying that. So we're talking about Spiriva or Tudorza, okay? That's a bronchodilator. Take it. Let it have some impact for 5 to 15 minutes. I'm not saying come back an hour later, but let it settle in. This is like when you put dishwashing soap in your sticky burnt pan, okay? Let it do some work before you come over and scrub. Let it start to open up the airways. Five to 15 minutes later, take this, so now you're getting, so, so let me just show it to you here, okay? So the first dose that we take of bronchodilator, okay, is gonna get us to here. So now we're, we're moving up in the chain of bronchodilation. Now that we're a little bit open, we take that second dose of bronchodilator, which in addition to the bronchodilator, brings the steroid in, and that steroid's not gonna work right now. Okay, that steroid is not gonna work today to make you less short of breath today. That's gonna work over the next several days, weeks, months to decrease inflammation. But now we are maximally bronchodilated because we have a long-term beta-2 agonist, we have a long-term anticholinergic, which are the two classes, column A, column B, of bronchodilation. And we got our steroid in maximally where we want it, okay? So, wouldn't it be great, okay, if we can now maintain this instead of coming here, getting in a jam, and then trying to re-achieve it? 
So how do we do this, okay? At this point, you should have circled your three, your three medications or your four medications. I already told you that these are 12-hour medications, okay? So for the majority of people, they will take Spiriva once a day, they'll take Advair either once a day or twice a day. But we know that these need to be taken 12 hours apart. You don't want to take your long-acting bronchodilator more than, more than once in a 12-hour period. And the reason for that is because it can have a stimulant effect. So if there's any type of heart issues or blood pressure issues, or uh, heart rhythm issues, arrhythmia, things like that, that could trigger a problem, okay? Uh, we had a situation very recently where someone came in, their heart rate was very high, uh, we were trying to figure out why, oh, I think I took my Advair twice, okay? So you got a double dose of a central nervous system stimulant, okay? So that is not what you wanna be doing. But now, we have these two 12-hour drugs. Let's plan this out. So if you take this, At 8 a.m., you know your next dose is going to be at 8 p.m. If you're an early riser and you take this at 6 a.m., your next dose is going to be at 6 p.m. Now, if you're a late riser and your first dose is at 11 p.m., and you're late, you stay up late watching TV, then your next dose is going to be at 11 p.m., okay? I can't tell you where that should or shouldn't be. You have to think about your lifestyle and decide what is going to be the best way for me to take these in which I'm getting the, the maximum benefit from it with the most convenience and that's going to give me the best chance of getting the maximal bronchodilation when I need it. So as an example, let's say you get up at 6 a.m. and between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. you basically read the newspaper, you may have breakfast, um, you're not doing anything that physically active or that would necessarily lead you to, to need the maximum bronchodilation, but at 8 a.m. you start working, okay? And you, need, you know that, it, or at 8 a.m. you go out to the grocery store and you need to, to be a little more physically active. So from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., so in a situation like that, maybe 8 a.m. is the right time for you to take those medications to become maximally bronchodilated so that you don't waste that during the time when you really don't need it. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna use that as my example. So that means that I'm gonna mark off here, and in this case, I'm gonna say, okay, 8 a.m., this is where I'm gonna take my long-acting medications. So at 8 a.m., I'm going to take my Spiriva, okay, which is a bronchodilator, right, only. It's an anticholinergic bronchodilator. I'm going to give it 5 to 15 minutes to start working, and then I'm going to take my Advair, which is a beta-2 agonist, long-acting beta-2 agonist, which is another bronchodilator, right? So we're now moving up from here to here, and I'm also getting my steroid, right? So that's 8 a.m. So if I take these medications twice a day, then I know that my next dose is going to be at 8 p.m., right? Next order of business, what happens in between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m.? So it would be great. Now, for some people, these, this doing it just 12 hours apart is enough to keep you up there in the green zone, okay, where you're breathing beautifully all day, maximally bronchodilated all day. I'm not gonna say maximally anti-inflamed all day because we know that inflammation is a longer term process, right? So by taking more and more anti-inflammation today, it doesn't mean I'm reducing my inflammation today. It still needs time to work. But I'm talking about maximal airflow because I am maximally bronchodilated, okay? I know this is somewhat confusing, but I will answer questions at the end, but I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna give you a very simple color by numbers formula as to how do you do it at the end. So again, right now, you should be marking off your 12 hours apart of where do you wanna take your long-acting bronchodilator and your combination long-acting bronchodilator steroid. So again, as I mentioned, it would be ideal if you could remain maximally bronchodilated all day. Okay? However, for most people, once that medication hits its maximum, over the course of time, it starts to lose its effectiveness, 
And that can also be affected. Remember, again, breathing is multifactorial. So guess what? You can be maximally bronchodilated, and then you go outside, and a bus exhaust comes right in your face, and now there's been an adjustment because your airways now are going to tighten to try to protect you from those fumes. Okay? So that now may be enough to get you to go from here to here, right? And then now you're, you're kind of stable over here, but now you're going to uh, work, and you have to work harder, and you're going down, down, down the hill. This is where other medications come in, okay? Because some people, in addition to these long-acting medications, are gonna supplement with short-acting medications, okay? So let me just point out one other thing. So if you have your, um, your Advair and your Spiriva, okay, and you've taken these at 8 a.m., and you know that you don't have to take them again until 8 p.m., and you know you're gonna be home by 8 p.m., then guess what? There's no sense in you carrying these around with you because you've already taken them. So if you get into a jam, you're not gonna take these anyway because I already just told you that these have to be taken 12 hours apart, right? So leave these at home. So when someone comes to me and I look in their pocket, I don't look in their pockets, but I see something, they're walking and something falls out of their pocket and I say, hey, you have your Advair with you, immediately I start to think that this person probably doesn't understand the best way to take their medications because if you get in a jam, this is the last thing you want to take. If you get in a jam, this is the last thing you want to take. It could actually even increase your problem, okay? So I've taken these at 8 a.m. I'm getting ready to leave the house. I'm gonna leave those at home. Now, we go to another type of drug. We're still talking about bronchodilators, right? but we have short-acting bronchodilators in each of these classes, okay, in these two classes. So in the anticholinergic, okay, or let's not start with anticholinergic, let's start with um, the beta-2 agonist. The most commonly used short-acting beta-2 agonist is albuterol. It has many names, it could be Provento, it could be Ventolin, it could be Pro-Air, okay, but it could be Zopinex. But essentially, all of these things are short-acting beta-2 agonists. Beta-2 agonists, what does that mean? Pro-fight or flight opens the airways, bronchodilates by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, okay? Now, if you get into a jam, these are your friends. Why are these your friends? Because they work fast. They start to work in one to five minutes. They reach their peak effect in five to 15 minutes. So if you are now in the street and you're about to hit code red, and you're going, <laughs> I'm, I'm about to be in trouble here, I'm working harder, my anxiety is picking up, my airways are getting tighter and tighter because I'm working harder to move air in and out. And we know that working harder to move air in and out is actually going to increase the tightness of our airways, increasing bronchoconstriction. This is gonna be your friend, okay? But what I'm trying to get you to understand and what I would love for you to ask your doctor is the following, okay? A lot of, can you come here for one second, please? Can you just fill that up from the reason? The question you've been waiting for is this. A lot of people think of these things as in case of emergency, break glass. Okay? It's called a rescue bronchodilator. Okay? And people think, I have to be about to keel over because I can't breathe before I take this. And in my opinion, okay, again, my opinion, this is not necessarily the most effective way of, of taking this. And the, the, the question is why? If I'm here, why do I have to wait until I get to here? Because at that point, I'm going, <laughs> And that's, that's not the time where you're going to get the best use of this medication anyway because you're going to be so panicked, you're not going to be thinking, slow my breathing down, deep breath out, let me take the puff, deep breath in, hold, one, two, three, four, five. No, what's happening then is you're in panic mode. So guess what? This is the time where I'm trying to get this Tylenol in my mouth, but I'm panicking and half the Tylenol is going over my shoulder. So guess what? Maybe a fraction of this stuff is getting into my lungs. And here's where I disagree with some people. With, who say that you should always wait to take this after your long-acting beta-2 agonist. Some people believe that by taking them too close together, you actually fill up all the binding sites. 
I get the theory. My gut feeling is that that's probably not true because the dosage is not so great that every single beta-2 binding site in your body is going to be full and totally refractory to this. Now, that being said, I've seen people who take this five, six, seven, eight times per day, and then you can become refractory to it, meaning that this is no longer going to be effective for you. So I want to try to get you to, to do things. Um, you know, it's like if you want to pack, okay, I'm a last minute packer. I like to pack right before I leave for the airport so that I know I have all my stuff. But sometimes what that leads to is running around like a maniac trying to stuff stuff into my suitcase, okay, as opposed to doing it in a calm, orderly fashion. If you're running around trying to stuff this into the suitcase that you call your respiratory system, the chances of you actually getting everything in that you need are much less than you take it before it hits the fan. Okay, so again, think about this. Ask your doctor, can I take this if I am feeling like I am starting to lose maximal bronchodilation? And what I mean by that is, if we're here at maximal bronchodilation, there should be a certain point at which you say, okay, I'm starting to go down from what I took in the morning, okay? But let me supplement up here rather than down here. Because remember, what I told you is that once we get to a certain point where we're really struggling, we're working hard to move that air in and out, and the harder we have to work to move that air in and out, the greater bronchoconstriction we're actually going to get. So you're working harder for less return on your money. So let's think about it like this. So let's go back to our timing again. And I'm going to start over because this looks a little bit chaotic, but Again, in my sole opinion, okay, if you take your long-acting medications at 8 and 8, that leaves you 12 hours in between, okay? I already told you that the short-acting bronchodilators can last for 4 to 6 hours, right? So if after 2 or 3 hours, you're already starting to get in a jam. Now, first of all, if any of your symptoms are worsening, meaning you feel like you need your medication sooner, if you need them more frequently, if you need more of them, that's a clear indication that something might be wrong and a clear indication that you need to see your doctor quickly, okay? But here's something else to think about. If I'm pretty good here, and I start to, to lose maximum effectiveness, lose maximum effectiveness, I would say, if it were me, okay, and I had access to these medications, and I was really losing effectiveness, somewhere between, let's say, four hours and six hours, so somewhere between 12 and two, if I'm having difficulty, I personally, would take a short-acting bronchodilator because guess what? I've come from here to here and now we get a little boost for the next four to six hours, okay? And then if we need to, in another four to six hours, we can take that again until we get to the point where we're at eight o'clock again, okay? So let's divide that into sixes for now. So eight, so we're talking about two, right? So if necessary, and again, please ask your doctor if you don't have a short-acting drug medication, aka a rescue inhale, say, you know what, sometimes I take my Advair, I take my Spiriva and my Advair in the morning, and I'm good until about mid-afternoon when I start to feel like I'm struggling to breathe, breathe again. Would it be a benefit to me to supplement this whole thing with a short-acting bronchodilator? And then six hours later, you're back to your second dose of the long-acting medication. Does that make sense? Question. What is anticholinergic mean? So anticholinergic, okay? So we have two systems. Again, sympathetic, parasympathetic. So the parasympathetic nervous system is essentially run by the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, right? So we don't want that. We don't want parasympathetic activity when it comes to our respiratory system because parasympathetic activity will decrease the airways. It will cause bronchoconstriction. Okay, the opposite of what we want. So when we say anticholinergic, okay, we're talking about this is working against the parasympathetic rest and digest system because that is not optimal for breathing. When we say beta-2 agonist, what does agonist sound like? 
antagonist, right? So antagonist means working against, agonist means working towards. So we're working against rest and digest, we're working to promote fight or flight. All these things work to open the airways, increase bronchodilation. Okay, is freeze a, considered a, uh, a part of We're not gonna go into freeze because I know that you believe in freeze, fight, flight, it's not a factor here. Okay, and it's, it's not, it's a, it's a diversion that I'm not gonna address at this time. It's a difference in opinion. Okay, I do believe there's something in freeze, but it's not gonna relate to your airways in this way. Okay, so okay, it's not really. Okay. I know what you're gonna say, we've had this conversation multiple times. For the people at home, we argue about fight, flight, freeze about once a month, okay, but we're not gonna go into that now, because it's not applicable to how it works the airways. Okay. There's no drug that affects freeze right here. Okay. Um, if you say, um, what's, what's the drug that has, a, what's the drug that does, a, that has also, um, uh, Okay, think about that when you have the question, bring it in. Harry, question. Yeah. Am I right that when you talk about Spiriva and Advair and how to use it, that applies as well to people who are taking one that is both an anti-inflammatory and a dilator like a Simbacort? Okay, so Simbacort, the question it? is, uh, am I correct in assuming that when you talk about taking uh, Spiriva and Advair, is it the same thing when you're talking about something like Simbacort? Okay, right. so it's not actually, it's, it's exactly the same, okay, but let me tell you this, Spiriva, I mean, I'm sorry, Spiriva and Advair is not the same as taking Simbacort. Taking Advair is the same as taking Simbacort, essentially, okay? Advair has two medications in it, right? So if we look at the sheet that I gave you here, and we look at Advair, Advair actually contains Flovec, which is a steroid and it contains Cerevent, which is a long-acting beta-2 agonist, okay? If we look at Simbacort, Simbacort contains, contains Budesonide, which is a steroid, and Formoterol, which is a long-acting beta-2 agonist. So Advair and Simbacort are the same classes. So they both contain a steroid and a long-acting beta-2 agonist. So if you're only taking one of these, okay, because not everybody takes these plus Spiriva. Right. So each, so when we talk about Advair or Simbacor, this is column one and column two. Or in this case, column one, uh, I'm sorry, column two and column three. So this really belongs here. So Simbacor and Advair contain long-acting beta-2 agonist anti-inflammatory. If we want to add column one to this, we're talking about either Spiriva or Tudorza, okay? So those are your three columns. So if all you take is Simbacort, then it doesn't matter. There's no first or second. You're gonna take that in the morning, okay? You're not, you can't separate the, the one from My the point, other, so you're gonna take it, right? okay? So, and, and, and then, so I just wanted to add, but I'm sorry. That's okay, go ahead, go ahead. So, you would still recommend taking them over a 12 hour period. Have to, have to. That's not, if you're taking Simbacort and or Advair, you must take those 12 hours apart. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It's not what I recommend. Those are 12 hours apart, okay? Um, it's like there's something in that that you don't want to take more than 12 hours, less than 12 hours apart. There's a stimulant, okay? It's like if I drink coffee, I know if I take my first cup at eight, and I usually take my second cup at 12. I have a cup now at eight, nine, 10, I have another cup. I'm gonna move around like this. So both Advair and Simbacort contain a stimulant in it, which is the beta-2 agonist, but because it's long-acting, it's actually stronger than if you took a short-acting beta-2 agonist. So the dose is increased. So you do not wanna take these less than 12 hours apart. Actually, my question is being the opposite, and that is because some people, including myself, are not informed enough by their doctors, about what the protocol is, there have been times when I felt well enough in the evening and don't take it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And okay? I assume what That's you're exactly saying is, what I'm if about. you want to get the maximum benefit. So the question is that her question is the opposite. So not can I take it less, 
but there are some people who, because they feel well, maybe skip that second dose, okay? That's something, first of all, you must discuss with your doctor. No questions asked, okay? You need to tell them. Don't just say, well, I felt well, so I didn't take it. Communicate with your doctor, okay? If you want that doctor to be able to understand your situation, diagnose you when you're sick, treat you when you don't feel well effectively, don't keep things from them. They need all the information, okay? But what I'm saying is that because this has a steroid in it, right? Both of these have a steroid. The anti-inflammatory medication in a steroid works best when it's taken consistently over time. Okay? Another question. Um, two questions. When is that new um, thing that you just put up, Tolera or to? You're talking about uh, Tudorza? Yeah. So when is this what? Is that new? It's, it's newer. The first long-acting anticholinergic was Spiriva. Um, question. Are there any questions from the homes, Chris, that we want to talk about? Okay. Uh, first question, are aero chambers beneficial for inhalers? Okay, the question is, are aero chambers beneficial for inhalers? That leads to another question, what is an aero chamber, okay? So the answer is yes, and I will talk about that. Uh, okay, let's talk about that now. So first of all, we talked about the timing of the medications, right? Let's talk about the technique of taking the medications, okay? Because one of the ironies about people who have uh, a very hard time coordinating their breathing is that all the medications you take require you to have excellent coordination of your breathing, okay? So let's start with this. I'm gonna show you something, and there are multiple, this is another thing that we're gonna talk about. So depending upon what you take, some of these things may be a, have a liquid inside, okay, that becomes aerosolized, okay? Some of these things may have a dry powder inside. Some of these things may have a capsule that you have to pierce, and then that becomes the medication, okay? There are differences between them, but there's one similarity between all of them. And the similarity between them is that in order for these to get deep into the lungs, they must be accompanied by a big whoosh of air. And that big whoosh of air comes in the form of a deep breath, right? So a lot of times I see people who are in a jam and they're going, oh, huh, huh, huh. And in the same way that I just blew this all over my face, okay, I see people blowing it all over their face or on their tongue or on the roof of their mouth, okay? If you feel it hit the roof of your mouth or hit your tongue or hit your lips, it's no way on earth that that is going to aerodynamically get into your lungs, which is why I don't want you to wait until you're at the end of the rope before deciding to take this medication, okay? The key to any medication is to take it right before your maximal inhalation. So what does that mean? I'm gonna show you how to take this. This particular form is called an MDI meter dose inhaler, okay? Because it, there's a meter that tells you how many doses it is. This is liquid inside that needs to be aerosolized, okay? As compared to, let's say, the cerement discus or the Advair discus, which has a dry powder inside, and when you press this button over here, it releases the powder. So with this one, okay, you don't get multiple shots. At, you don't get multiple bites at the apple. Whereas with this one, if you don't get all the medication in the first shot, you can take another breath and you can actually finish up the medication. Whereas with this, you really need to take it properly. So for the person at home who asked that question about air chambers, believe it or not, this is on your topic, okay? So the first thing is that this is a liquid, right? In order to make this very effective, this liquid must be shaken up very vigorously. Some people think they go, no, this is not getting ready to squeeze ketchup on your french fries, okay? You are trying to break up this liquid into small particles because we know from very scientific research that particle size is crucial to getting these things in your uh, airways, okay? It's the equivalent of chewing your food, okay? So you need to chew, 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 break this up into little pieces. Now, remember, I told you that the best way to get this into your airways is by bringing it in with the maximal whoosh of air. How do you get in the maximal whoosh of air? You have to first blow out the maximal whoosh of air, 
okay? So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take a deep breath in just to warm up. I've already shaken this up. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to blow all the air out. Because now I'm empty, now I'm ready to take it in. I'm going to put this up to my mouth, and as I start to breathe in, I'm going to press. So let me show you one more time. Breathe in. Blow all the air out. Put this in my mouth. Start to breathe in. I'm joking, five minimum. Some people will say 10. Okay, so what did I just do there? I blew all the air out, getting ready, right? That's like winding up. I start to breathe in. I take this big breath in where this medication combines with my air. I take the deepest breath I can to bring it as deep into the lungs as I can. And then I hold it because what's going on as I'm holding it is this medication is spreading out. Okay? Now the majority of people who take albuterol, okay, in a situation like this, if you're advised to take two puffs of this medication, that doesn't mean, okay, because as soon as you press that, it's no longer shaken up and your particle size goes back to being liquid. So in between every puff, you must shake this up, chewing the food again, okay? You must break this up into small particle size. Now here's another thing. Some people will say, no, you don't have to do what I'm about to tell you to do. But think about it from a logical point of view. If one of these puffs starts to open me up a little bit, right, wouldn't it be beneficial to wait a minute or two minutes or three minutes to let this start to work so that now I'm ready for my second puff and I'm going to blow all the way out, deep breath in, Now I'm starting to get really bronchodilated here, so I don't know what's going to happen in the next few minutes. It could go crazy here, okay? You've been warned. Now, for a lot of people, that is a difficult thing to do. It's tough to coordinate it with the breathing. It's tough to coordinate it with the pressing. It's tough to make sure that you angle it properly so that it goes in with a whoosh of air. That's where the aero chamber comes in, okay? And there are multiple different types of aero chambers. Another name for this is a spacer, okay? And what a spacer does is it essentially takes away your job of combining it with a whoosh of air because that whoosh of air is built in here. So the way that most spacers work, okay, you still have to shake it up, okay? So I'm going to shake it up. This fits in the back here, okay? but it gives you a little bit of an extra shot at taking another bite at the apple. Same technique, breathe in, blow all the way out. Put this in your mouth, start to breathe in and press. My lungs are probably so open right now they might start to come out of my mouth, okay? <laughs> However, if that happens, Keep going. Now, other things to be aware of with this, okay? A lot of people don't know this, but most spacers will make a sound if you breathe in very hard and fast, okay? I've heard people say that that means you're doing it correctly. It means the opposite. If you hear the sound, it means that you are breathing in too hard and fast. Remember that the airways like things to be nice and smooth. We want to sneak this medication by the airways, okay? So again, look what I do. I'm still taking my maximal breath in, but I am not hearing that sound because I'm doing it in a nice controlled fashion. So that's my first dose. No, I'm not going to take the second dose now, okay? But you shake this up again, put it in here, deep breath in, blow all the air out, Take a breath, start to breathe in, press. Hold two, three, four, five to 10 seconds, okay? Let me just give you a, a demo of a couple of other these. Now, we talked about Advair, okay? So with Advair, what we have here is we have a powder in here, okay? And with this powder, and, and again, what I'm saying now applies to everything. It applies to all these medications. The key is you want maximal exhalation so that you can take maximal inhalation. 
when you actuate this, you press this, and that opens a, a, a little door here that brings the correct amount of powder into this. Now, the powder's sitting here, okay? I don't have to worry about it escaping like with the meter dose inhaler, but same thing. Breathe in, blow all the way out, take this in your mouth, hold, two, three, four, five, let it spread. If you're not sure if you got the full dose, maybe there's still some powder in here, do it again, okay? Make sure that you've taken all the powder out of it. A couple of things also very important to mention. For any of the inhaled steroids, or any of the combination drugs that contain an inhaled steroid. So for the majority of things, if you're taking Qvar, if you're taking Pomacort, if you're taking Alvesco, Aerobid, Flovid, Asmacort, Asmanex, or any of the combination drugs like Advair, Simbacort, Dulera, or Brio Elliptor, those contain a steroid. And so after you take that medication, it is essential that you gargle and spit after every use. That's another reason to take that one last, okay? Not the same with the beta-2 agonist, not the same with the anticholinergic, but if that steroid stays in your throat, okay, it can cause a fungus called thrush, and even if it doesn't, it, some people complain of having a hoarse voice with it because that steroid can actually coat your vocal cords or coat your throat and give you a hoarse voice. So it doesn't mean rinse your mouth. It doesn't mean brush your teeth, okay? We're not looking for pearly whites here. We're looking to get that steroid out of your throat. So that means take it. Gargle. If I wasn't at the pulmonary center, I would spit, but I'm not going to. Um, but gargle and spit after every use. So let's just take a moment to review everything we've talked about in five minutes, and then we're going to move on to one other thing. So again, you want to understand the order in which you take things. So if you look at the list again, there are two main classes. There's bronchodilators and steroids, right? Of our bronchodilators, there are two classes, the beta-2 agonists and the anticholinergic. So for the majority of people who take a long-acting anticholinergic and a combination of a long-acting beta-2 agonist and a steroid, where I would personally recommend that you ask your doctor, can I take the long-acting bronchodilator only, which is the anticholinergic, first, we take that, we start to get bronchodilation, we then take the second combination drug, which is a bronchodilator, which is going to open you further and make way for the star of the show, the steroid, okay? After you do that, gargle and spit. By that point, you should be getting to be maximally bronchodilated. As you feel like your breathing is, is starting to lose its effectiveness over the course of the day, can we supplement with a short-acting medication? Now, the short-acting medications all, also can fall under two categories. The anticholinergic, okay, which is something like a, a, a atrovent, okay, or if we, if we think of it as a nebulizer, okay, hypotropium bromide, or the other one is albuterol, or if we think of it as a nebulizer, albuterol sulfate, okay? There's also a drug which is a combination of short-acting anticholinergic uh, and beta-2 agonist, and that would be Combivent, okay? And if you take it in a nebulizer, okay? Let me just show you one thing. I'm gonna take these down for a second. So let's go through our day. So we've started our day, we've taken our Spiriva, we've taken our Advair. So with Spiriva and Advair, we've got our long-acting anticholinergic bronchodilator, gets the bronchodilation started. We have our Advair or Simbacort, which is a second long-acting bronchodilator plus the steroid. Now we should be up here, okay? Now we're starting to get into a jam and you know, we're starting to feel like we're less bronchodilated and so now we want to take a short-acting medication. That can fall also under the same two categories, beta-2 agonist, which would be something like an albuterol, and again, there's many different names of albuterol. Here's Pro-Air, uh, Ventolin, Proventil, and or Atrovent, which is the short-acting version of Spiriva, so a short-acting anticholinergic. 
The difference between the beta-2 agonists and the anticholinergics, or one of the differences, is that the anticholinergics have less stimulant effect. So if you're somebody who's prone to a rapid heart rate, high blood pressure, um, arrhythmia, you might be more, your physician might be more inclined to recommend atrovent versus an albuterol, okay? But the ideal would be a combination of both, combivent and or um, duoneb if it's in the nebulizer, okay? So that's ipotropium bromide and that. And then we work our way through the course of the day until we get back to our second dose of Advil, okay? Let's just talk about a couple of other things. How do you take them? Okay, so there's other considerations. One of the considerations is, do you take all these different things here? Do you take these MDIs, meter dose inhalers, inhalers, or nebulizers? Okay, and so people ask about that. A nebulizer is essentially a machine where you will take the liquid, put it into a cup, and that aerosolizes it for you, and you get your treatment over the course of, let's say, five to 15 minutes, okay? The benefit of that is instead of getting one shot at getting that all the way in, you can actually sit and in a relaxed way, breathe in and out, gradually increasing your bronchodilation, okay? The downside of it is it's not always convenient to have this machine around you, okay? So for some people that are having a hard time getting the benefits from some of these pumps or inhalers, then a nebulizer is possibly a solution that you could use when you're home to make sure that you're getting the bronchodilation. Can we get another question from home? Okay, uh, actually it has to do with nebulizers. Uh, should you take meds from a nebulizer with or without oxygen concentrator? Good question. So the question is, should you take medications from a nebulizer while, I'm assuming what you mean by that is should you keep your oxygen concentrator on while you're doing your nebulizer, okay? now. There's a way that we can nebulize you using an oxygen tank. So in other words, if you don't have that machine, I can give you the device, hook it up to an oxygen tank, and if I give you five or six liters, that will create an aerosolizing effect and allow you to take the nebulizer in that way. But when I do it that way, you're actually getting a supplemental oxygen with it. Most people at home do not nebulize like that. Most people actually use the machine. So, Despite the fact that you're getting these bronchodilators, you're getting these medications through the nebulizer, if you, have a, if you desaturate, then that's not going to prevent you from desaturating. Or it's going to start to bronchodilate you, which may raise your saturation a little bit, but if you use two or three or four liters per minute, that's not going to give you enough oxygen to keep you saturated. So if you're actually taking your nebulizer from a nebulizer itself, as opposed to hooking your, your, yourself up to an actual oxygen tank, which most people don't do. We use it in emergency medical services because we have an oxygen tank and we don't have a nebulizer. Then you should keep your oxygen concentrator on. The other thing that a lot of people don't know is that oxygen is also a mild bronchodilator. Okay, so if you are taking your nebulizer with your albuterol and your ipotropium bromide, not only are you getting your two bronchodilators, your beta-2 agonist and your anticholinergic, but you're also getting a third mild bronchodilator in the oxygen itself. Do we have another question, Chris? Uh, is Pro-Air a bronco bronchodilator? Pro-Air is a bronchodilator, okay? So if you look at this list right here, let's look for Pro-Air. Is Pro Air on here? That is a good question. Does anyone see Pro Air? Okay, here is Pro Air, okay, which has to be added to that list. Pro Air, albuterol sulfate, okay, so in the same way that we see a, a generic there, albuterol sulfate, Pro Air is a short acting beta 2 agonist. Next question, Chris. Okay, uh, of the combination medications, is there one that is less likely to cause rush? Of the combination medications, is there one that is less likely to cause thrush? Okay, we talked about two different combination medications. One is something like Combiment, which call, contains the two bronchodilators. Those don't cause thrush. Any medication, whether it's a freestanding steroid, like a Flovent, like a Q-Bar, like a Palmacort, like an Asthmacort, or a combination medication that contains a steroid, like an Advair, like a Simbacort, like a Dulera, like a Brio Olympta, if it contains a steroid, it has the same likelihood of causing thrush. Next question. This is the speed round. I'm giving you four more minutes. Let's go. Uh, 
Should I take Advair or Spariva first? Okay, should I take Advair or Spariva first? Who's the star of the show? The steroid. Which one contains the star of the show? The Advair, right? So if I take, if I'm locked up, I don't, I want to clear this area of paparazzi before I bring the star in. Who's going to clear the area? The bronchodilator, the spariva, right? Let the spariva come in, start getting people out of the hallway so that when the star comes in, it's unencumbered. When you take the Advair second, you get that double dose of bronchodilator opening you up even more, but bringing in the steroid when you're the most open and you have the greatest chance of using the steroid. Next question. I was thinking levobutyrol first, then Spiriva, then Simbacor. Is that wrong? Okay, so I was thinking levobutyrol, then Spiriva, then, then what? Then Simbacor. Okay, so are you wrong? I don't know you, so you might not be wrong for you, okay? I wouldn't personally do it that way. Why? Because levobutyrol is Zopinex, okay? Look at the sheet. Zopinex is a beta-2 agonist. It's a short-acting beta-2 agonist. Okay, the, uh, the Advair contains a long-acting beta-2 agonist. So what I said here is if I have a headache I don't wanna, and I only have a certain amount of Tylenol, I don't want to take a 500 milligram extra strength Tylenol and then take a 325 milligram extra strength Tylenol. I'd rather take that 500 when I feel like my headache might come back supplement with the 325. So what we talked about before is don't take your, your Zopinex at that time, take your two long acting ones, okay? And then as you start to feel like you need a supplement, that's Zopinex time, okay? But understand that Zopinex, Levalbuterol, or Albuterol, or Preventil, or Ventolin, or Max Air, or Pro Air, those are the short acting versions of what's in the Advair and Simbacor. That's the short acting version of that. So I'm not gonna take a short acting version of the same, it's redundant almost, okay? So I would suggest doing your Spiriva, long acting anticholinergic, do your long acting combo of beta-2 agonist and, and steroid, and then later on, let's save that supplement, I call it a supplementary drug as opposed to a rescue drug for when I start to feel like I'm getting in a jam. And again, don't wait till you're at the end of the rope and your airways are already tight and getting constricted and you're having trouble moving air in and out. Because remember what I told you, you need nice relaxed airways to move that in and out most effectively. Next question. How do you know when your rescue inhaler, like Ventolin, is empty? Okay, very good question, very difficult question to understand, to, to answer, okay? At one time, there were people who said if you float this, depending upon the position, okay, you can tell how much is in it. I don't believe that is true necessarily. Okay, the best, the single best way to do it, now there are some of these that actually come with a meter on it, so you can actually turn it around and it will tell you how many dosages are left. If it is not that, okay, it is to your best, it is in your best interest to count them up, okay? It is just in your best interest to record them. Most of these, let's see how many doses this contains. 200 meter inhalations, okay? So to me, I'm gonna start, you know, if you take your medication regularly, you can do it by weeks, you can figure it out. But if you take it a little bit less frequently or a little less regularly, I would suggest recording it. Every time you pump this, make a, make a note, okay? Um, if you're in doubt, if you're not sure if there's enough in here, get a new one, okay? Don't be, be caught with too much of a medication as opposed to too little of a medication where you're in a jam uh, and then you, you don't have what you need. Here's something else, okay? If I ask you where this is and you tell me it's on your sink at home, you're not doing it right, okay? This is only gonna be effective with you if you have it with you, okay? Which brings me to another point which I meant to talk about which I forgot but I'm gonna talk about it now. For exercise, okay, very often we know that exercise is going to increase the demand on your airways. So we actually have people who come here five to 15 or 30 minutes before their exercise session, or we have them do this, you know, before they actually need to do something bigger. So let's just talk about a couple of situations. So if I know in, in, in a half hour I'm gonna be exercising and I'm feeling kind of tight, maybe I wanna get the ball rolling good airflow, right, by taking this 15 minutes before I work out. 
ask your doctor if that's okay. Likewise, if you live someplace where it's, it's 20 degrees outside and you know that as soon as you go out, that air, that cold air hits your system and you lock up, maybe five to 15 minutes, you know, maybe 15 to 30 minutes before you go outside, you want to take this dose or you want to nebulize so that you go out. We want to, in other words, what I'm talking about with every single thing I've talked about tonight, we want to stack the deck in favor of your airways. We want to stack the deck in terms of decreasing inflammation, open, opening the airways, keeping you maximally bronchodilated at all times. And if you give it a little bit of thought, it makes sense. So what I would do after this is I would make sure that I've circled the medications that I take, understand what they do and what they take them for, and, and then take this worksheet and start to figure out. Now here's something else you could do. You can do a little assessment, okay? So print this out a number of times, and over the course of the next week, every two to four hours, just make a note to yourself. What did I take? How do I feel? What do I take? How do I feel? Okay? And what we would be able to do over the course of time is we would be able to start to see a pattern. So, okay, I felt kind of bad, then I took these medications here, but at 2 o'clock is where I really started to feel like I was having difficulty. So if you know and you see this pattern that every day for a week, 2 o'clock is where your medication starts to wear out, then guess what? At 12 o'clock, I'm looking to supplement so that I don't even get to that point. Because remember, once you start to go down and you're working that much harder to move air in and out, it's a, it's a cycle. So the harder I work, the more inflamed and the more tight and bronchoconstricted the airways become. So let's not let it get to that point, okay? Next question. Are the short aero chambers as effective as the larger ones? I think, the, yeah, I think the short aero chambers are as effective. I think we just want to create a little bit of space. So, so, so the question was, are the short aero chambers as effective as the larger ones? Um, well, if you know those really long ones that sit on the floor that you had in college, um, those are less effective for bronchodilation <laughs> than these aero chambers, okay? But what I'm talking about is, Essentially, they're all the same, and it doesn't matter which one you get. Maybe there's going to be a slight difference, but I know that people are going to be more likely to carry a smaller one than a big one. Okay, so if you have one that's like, you know, that's smaller, it is going to serve the purpose. The main thing that this aero chamber does is it prevents this from shooting out in a controlled way and winding up on your tongue or your throat. What this does is it's naturally creating a whoosh of air for you, and when you you're still stacking the deck in your heart. So I don't care which one you use, again, whatever is gonna be, is, is, you're gonna use, that's the one I want you to use.